I'm Robert Bruce Thompson and this is the Make Science Room video series. This is the first segment of a group that we'll do on making chemicals on the cheap, converting common household items, chemicals you can buy at the drugstore, grocery store, hardware store, and so on, into more expensive and difficult to obtain laboratory chemicals. In this first segment, my friend and tech advisor, Dr. Mary Sherbinak, is going to react ordinary root killer, copper sulfate root killer, from the hardware store, and baking soda from Costco to produce copper carbonate, which we'll use in later segments to manufacture various copper-based compounds. So take it away, Mary. All right, we'll begin with two readily available compounds. The copper sulfate is readily available from Home Depot. This is about a two pound bottle for eight bucks. And the sodium, oh, <laughs> still heavy, hydrogen carbonate or sodium bicarb or baking soda. This is a 12 pound bag from Costco, cost about $5. Oh my goodness, that is heavy. All right, we'll first begin by weighing out 100 grams of copper sulfate. First, place the weigh boat on the scale and tear the scale to zero out the weight of the weigh boat. And I'll begin by pouring in my beautiful blue crystals. Do a rough weigh first, just to get close to 100 grams. And then I'm going to use my spatula to add the crystals incrementally so I can hit 100 grams. And we are just about perfect. Great. I am now going to dissolve this 100.35 grams of copper sulfate in about 400 milliliters of water. Now that I've added the copper sulfate to my 400 milliliters of water, you can see it makes a beautiful blue solution. It doesn't appear to have dissolved, and um, this is a, a good time to talk about solubility versus dissolution. Copper 2 sulfate is, pentahydrate is actually very readily soluble in water, 320 grams uh, per liter. So 320 grams of copper sulfate will dissolve in a liter of water very readily but uh, it dissociates slowly. So although dissolution and solubility seem to be related, the two concepts are actually quite distinct. Solubility is a thermodynamic property, while, where, whereas dissolution rate is kinetic. Um, a compound may be readily soluble, but very slow to dissolve, as copper sulfate is. Another compound may be relatively insoluble, but quick to dissolve. And a good example of that are lead salts and uh, several other heavy metal salts. Our copper sulfate has dissolved in the water to make this beautiful deep blue solution. We will now add very gradually um, 67.29 grams, which is the stoichiometric equivalent of baking soda, which I've pre-weighed. Um, we'll have to be careful because this is a reaction that releases a good bit of carbon dioxide, so it will foam and hiss and could erupt over the top of the beaker. To talk a little bit about relative solubility, so you can see the precipitate forming. There, nice, the foaming reaction. As I mentioned before, about 320 grams of copper sulfate will dissolve in a liter of water. To dissolve the same mass of copper carbonate uh, requires 219,000 liters of water, or more than 100,000 two liter soda bottles, or a uh, backyard swimming pool. Each molecule of the copper sulfate reacts with two molecules of the sodium hydrogen carbonate, or the sodium bicarb, to form one molecule of copper carbonate, one molecule of sodium sulfate, one molecule of water, 
and as you can see here, one molecule of carbon dioxide. Once the reaction is complete, I will filter and let that sit for a minute while I assemble my filtration apparatus. This is a Buchner funnel and a vacuum flask. The flask is extra thick glass sides to withstand pressure. And you can also gravity filter this, but a Buchner funnel is nice. Uh, a Buchner funnel with a filtration a Buchner funnel with a filtration flask is nice because it just speeds up the process and helps pull the extra moisture out of the crystals so they dry that much faster. You can hear that I'm generating a bit of a vacuum because that filter paper keep the filter paper moist and make sure that all the holes are covered so none of the solution can escape. I'm going to keep that flask, keep the beaker swirled a little bit so the crystals don't, the precipitate doesn't settle. And you can see how quickly this nice little hand pump pulls that liquid right out of the crystals. Looks like we're just about there in terms of what we can do with this little hand pump. Give this another rinse. The water I'm using here is deionized water, so I'm not introducing anything unnecessary into my crystals. Now, this looked very dry when we were filtering it, but you can see there's still a good bit of moisture. Now, I was trying to pull this out without disrupting the filter paper. I torn it a little bit, but we'll be able, once the crystals are dry, the filter paper should detach very easily. And unfortunately there's a good bit of rupture there, but the crystals, once they, once they dry, will be a nice powder and should be very easy to handle. Right now they're kind of gummy. You can see they're quite sticky. But it looks like we have an excellent yield here of copper carbonate. And you can see how they might be used as a pigment because they do have a paint, a very thick paint-like consistency at this point. Copper carbonate, is a bit of history associated with it, it was the first chemical compound to be broken down into its component elements of copper, um, carbon, and oxygen. trying to make as little mess as possible, and it's really not, not working. The French chemist Louis Proust did exactly that in 1794, and it was a uh, really the beginning, in many ways, of analytical chemistry. We can certainly capture more of this by rinsing or just allowing the funnel to dry and taking the dry crystals out. Okay, thanks to Mary's work, we now have 100 plus grams of relatively pure copper carbonate. We'll use that in later segments to produce various copper compounds, including copper acetate and copper chloride.